Well, I hope that all is well and that uh, you are having a good week wherever you're at. Uh, we are in a series uh, looking at the big picture of God's plan of redemption. We're calling it the story of stories. And it's good, I think, at times to take the 30,000 foot view um, and and look at what God is doing in the world. And we've kind of broken it up into four parts, and we're going to end with Easter here uh, next month. Uh, But we're in the beginning looking at the ruler. God establishes the earth, and he is the king. And so if you want to catch up maybe on last week or whatever, that'll make more sense if if you hear that one before today. Um, But if not, that's okay too. I'd like to pray for us before we dive in and just ask for God's help as we look into his word today. Let's uh, let's pray. God, we come to you and uh, just want to be still before you. Thank you that you've given us your word and that we can look at it today. Thank you that you've uh, brought incredible hope into this world through Jesus. And as we look at the story of redemption, the gospel, and all that you're doing, that you would just encourage our hearts and show us more and more how to walk with you and bring this good news to the people around us, wherever you take us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, last week we looked at the creation of uh, the heavens and the earth, and we stopped short of looking at the creation of humans on purpose. And so we're going to look into that today, and we're going to see basically two different ideas today. One is being made in God's image, and what is that all about? And then also the, the first great commission. Some people call it the cultural mandate. When God created humans, what did he tell them to do and be about? Um, so he established his rule and his reign over all he made. And, and again, since he made it, he has the rights uh, over it and is the king over all the universe. Um, We saw last week that when God spoke, it happened. And then he also declared that it was good each day as as we went through the creation story. Um, And again, I I said this already, but we we stopped short of looking at the, the, the kind of the pinnacle of creation. So we look at the creation of humanity today. Um, Specifically, though, what what is being made in the image and likeness of God? What does that mean? What's it all about? What does it imply? And then this this mandate, like who are we? And then what are we supposed to be about? What are we for? Uh, What are we made for is another way you could ask the question. So let's start with the image. Look at uh, Genesis 1, 26. And this is probably pretty familiar to you. If not, uh, hopefully it will be after today. Genesis 1, 26 <clears throat> says this, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion <clears throat> pardon me, over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, over all and over all the earth, and every other creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So, now we've had, you know, the, the, the heavens and the earth created and all the, you know, the waters and seas being separated from the land and the animals and the birds and the, the things in the oceans and the seas. And now it comes to God saying, let us make man in our image after our likeness. So there's a few things, obviously, that are different here. Before, he, would, uh, he had created the, the trees and the, and the plants after their own kind and the animals each after their own kind. But now we are created, humans are created set apart from all other things in the image and likeness of God. This has massive implications, as we're going to see. And this is where Judaism and Christianity differ from all other religions and philosophies about where humans came from. This defines things like how we think about gender and work, our purpose in life, and and so much more. God completes his creation by making humanity in his image. And again, he affirms here later in verse 31 that this is not just good, as he has said each day before, but this is very good. So humans are the culmination of God's good creation. They're different from all his other handiwork. Um, This first statement that he made the male and female alike. We're like God in some way, but what is that way? So some people have, there's been a lot of people, right, study and talk about this, but things like spirituality, morality, just that we relate to one another, that we use language that are rational and even creative, it, it sets us apart from animals. And again, not all people believe this, but the the, the idea in Christianity and Judaism is that our likeness to God is 
setting us apart from all other things in the animal kingdom. We are not animals, uh, contrary to some people's belief. This is a fundamental distinction that's absolutely crucial to understanding everything about life and who we are. Verse 27 continues, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. This is not our, our topic for today, but there are two genders, male and female, despite what some of the craziness uh, in our world says. And this is this is rooted, this fact of two genders is rooted in creation itself, the way God has made us. Listen to the way Psalm 8 describes this image of God, this creating of humanity. It starts out by saying, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You've set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babies and infants, you, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. But then listen to this part. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place. So he says, I, I think about creation, all that you've made. What is man that you are mindful of him? The son of man that you care for him. Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. This is talking about being made in God's image. We are set apart from the rest of the created things here. And then verse 6 of Psalm 8, you've given him dominion over the works of your hands. You put all things under his feet. Oh, and then it just lists the beasts of fields and the birds and all that. And then it says, oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. God is lifted high because he has, in a sense, lifted us up. But what is being made in the image of God mean? Like what's it, what's it getting at? We're not gods. We're not like little gods running around. We're not um, somehow equal to God. So what does it mean to be in the image of God? We're going to talk about this throughout, but here's just a few ideas. Image is to reflect and to represent God. So reflection, to reflect God's goodness and glory. Uh, one writer said it this way, what, what are we talking about? What, what, in what sense are we in the image of God? Um, I already mentioned morality, sense of right and wrong, and all that kind of stuff. Um, you don't find too many monkeys creating a Mona Lisa, like an artistic sense or whatever, or creativity in that way. Um, those are kind of true aspects, but the simplest or plainest thing that really kind of helps you to see it, think about a, a sculpture, for example. If someone makes an image, like a sculpture of a person, uh, you put it to put that on display and show them something about that someone. So you put it in the middle of town, so you want people to notice it, think about it, know who that person, ask who is this person, what did they do, what are they all about, they were noble or strong or wise, or they had some impact on history or whatever it is, that, that it represents that person to the world. So that's kind of a sense in which, and we'll come back to uh, some other illustrations here in a minute, but that's a sense in which we are images of God, we're in his image, we're little statues in a sense. We're not statues, so it's not a good, perfect analogy. Another one is a mirror. We reflect who God is when people see us. Um, I don't know if you ever did this when you were little or maybe when you're, when you're old. Um, take like a, a mirror and, and try to, you know, in a really bright sunlight and try to like start a fire or maybe with a microscope. Um, not a microscope. Um, my, my brain's not working. A magnifying glass. Microscope would be a, a way to do it too, I think. But magnifying glass, I unfortunately I have to admit to you that when I was a child growing up in the desert, we had ants and I would burn those suckers with that thing. I was, I was a little punk. My sister would get mad at me and try to keep me from doing that. But we reflect God like a mirror reflects your image. The thing you're seeing is not actually you, but it's an image of you. And all these are going to kind of come up a little short <clears throat> because we don't have a a perfect analogy. But here's a few things about being an, uh, an image bearer. This is kind of what it means. First, you're a relational person. Um, you're made to reflect the original. You're not the original. And, and neither are you. Not, you're not really, um, you're, you're showing something of who God is by the fact that you're a relational person. Um, we, we like to say things, maybe when you're younger, you say things, like, oh, I'm my own person. I'm going to do things my way. And then even in that, you realize you're really just the sum total of like your family and your friendships and the people that have shaped your life. And maybe if you're married, it's your, it's your spouse. And, and, you, and if you have kids, your kids. Um, so we're relational. That's part of what it means to be in the image. The other thing is you are a spiritually dependent being. Everybody is. Um, just like a mirror can only reflect something. It's not that thing in and of itself. 
you can't. Uh, you, you get this this sense and dependence from outside of you. And the only reason we exist, whether you believe in God or not, is because we've been created in His image. So there's kind of this relational part and this spiritual dependent part of it. So thinking about the image of God, we'll come back to at the end some of the implications of this, but God made you in His image. And that is where you get your dignity, your value, and your worth from in every single human being on the planet that's ever lived and ever will has that dignity and worth and value. That's the sense in which we say all people are in one way children of God. They're specifically brought into the family when they become Christians. But the image of God, God does something here that is incredible in creating men and women, humans. But then he does something else. He blesses them. Look at verse 28. This is going to get us into this this great, the, the first great commission, one writer I, I came across last week called it. I think it was actually on a podcast. He said, the great commission we think of is the, the go and make disciples. But God gave this first mandate, this first sending out early on, immediately after he created Adam and Eve. It says, and God blessed them. I don't want to skip over that. We already saw the blessing with the animals when he said, go, you know, be fruitful and multiply. But God is very concerned about having a relationship with these people, with humans, with us. God blesses them. His favor is upon them. He's made them and he blesses them. But then God speaks again. And all the other, uh, you know, part of the creation story, he speaks and it happens this time. Uh, it's, it's, it's a series of things that are that he's sending his image bearers out to do. How are they to live? What are they supposed to be about? What are they supposed to do? And this is verse 28. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So we see this, this great commission, this mandate. God gives four things here for them to be about. And they're, they're, some of them are closely related to each other, but I just want to go through them one at a time. The first one is be fruitful and multiply. This means exactly what you think it means. The earth has to be people, right? So go and have babies. Um, every new person will also, from that day forward, bear the image of God. They're going to be after their own kind in that sense. They're going to bear the likeness and image of God. So um, I say this pretty often, but this is the greatest way to impact the world is by having kids and raising them to follow Jesus. There is no better investment of your time and your energy and your life. Um, if you are still uh, of the child, you know, bearing age, have kids, have more kids. Um, and I'm not, I'm not going to tell you what to do, but this is an incredible opportunity to pour into people and to raise them to follow God and to serve him on this earth. So the first one is pretty obvious. Have children, be fruitful and multiply. But then he says, fill the earth. Some people put fill the earth with be fruitful and multiply. I mean, it's just kind of the same thing. That's, that's what's going to happen when you're fruitful and multiply. But I think it's his command here is to make culture, to, to fill the earth with institutions and things and, 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 and continue to help things grow and move forward. His command to work uh, was a command to change and even enhance what he has made. Think about the garden that we're going to read about here in a minute. The garden was needed to be cared for and, and grown and tended and, ex and expanded. Adam and Eve weren't supposed to leave God's creation as it was, but they were to make something out of it, continue to develop it. They and their descendants would work the garden, as we'll see in a second. That'd be cultivate, you know, plants and trees and all that kind of stuff. But also things like arts and sciences and the public square, just culture in general. Humans are developing culture. They're, they're given the, the call to fill the earth. So have children, fill the earth. And then this next one is closely tied to this as well. Subdue it. And I, I like uh, one definition I read this week. Make the earth more useful for others, more beneficial for others. Make things subdue uh, gets kind of a bad rap. Like we're supposed to like, you know, calm it down or whatever, domesticate it or make it not so wild. And there's some truth in some of that. Right. And some things that are wild can kill you. And so you have to, you know, 
protect yourself from them and get them away from people or whatever. Um, but when you do things like teach or work at the mill or fix equipment or build roads or you do billing for your company or accounting or you do people's taxes, um, cleaning your house, doing dishes, bringing in firewood, removing trees for people that need them to be removed, planting trees, you know, mowing lawns, you're making the earth or maybe just your house more useful, more beneficial. And this is God, think about this. He creates this incredible place and says, go and care for it. Go and, go and create. Go and do. And, and this is the work I've called you to. So if you're a cop or a part of the justice system or you're making laws or doing foster care, running a daycare, feeding, I mean, you could, you could name all the different good things that people do, serving the poor. This is subduing the earth. Uh, this is part of our mandate, this first great commission where God says, go for it. I, I created you. I'm blessing you. Go and fill the earth, make it great, and, uh, and, and continue to improve. This is both for the individual things like our homes and whatever, or our property or our, our families, uh, but it's also institutional. Think of things like the educational system and hospitals and just all the good things that have been created by humans when God set them loose to do that. So then he says, uh, we already read this too, but it says, have dominion. Uh, dominion is sometimes called the dominion mandate or the creation mandate. Um, but dominion here is ruling over. So we think of dominion sometimes as, as a negative thing, like, oh, you're not the boss of me, or I, I you know, I'm not going to pay taxes to a king or, or whatever. We think of the government as having dominion. But we're this is a positive command for us. We're supposed to rightly represent God on earth as, as his little kings and queens. We're, we're, we're supposed to have dominion over the earth. We're, we're doing this on behalf of God, not instead of God. Um, remember, this wasn't their world. God didn't say, I'm giving you this world. He said, this is my world, um, but you are going to care for it and cultivate it so it'll become the place I intend it to be. And I'm going to do that through you. This is the story's anthropology, the big story. This is what man is for. This is what man is for. So God has announced already this is a very good world. And the world that he made and the capacity we have to make something of it and out of it is good. And they, it's been good from the very beginning. The problem isn't that we make culture, but sometimes the problem is the type of culture we make. And, and we haven't even talked about this yet, but there are some big problems with our world, right? Um, we're going to talk about the fall of this, the, the, the rebellion next week specifically. But God gave us capacity to create culture and then commanded us to use that capacity. He made us, again, in his likeness and his image and gave us all the capacities uh, that are included in that. And then he commanded us to use the gifts. Go for it. Go do it. So in chapter one of Genesis, we, we, we kind of see the big picture of God's creation, days one through six, and then he rests. But then in chapter two, Actually, he doesn't rest till chapter two, but all creation up to humanity. Then he rests, but then we zoom in on the special relationship with humans that God has. So it, it zooms in and says, God and his image bearers, there's actually a relationship that God wants to have with them. Look down at uh, verse seven of Genesis two, if you have your Bible open still. It zooms in closely, more closely on how God does the creating of humans. And then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. So he gets life when God breathes life into him. But then it says, And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to sight, or to the sight, and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And we'll come back to that tree uh, next week. But a river flowed out of Eden to water the garden, and there it divided and became four rivers. The name of the first is Pishon, and it flowed all around the land of Havilah, where there is gold, and the gold of that land is good. And then he named some other stones, Bedellium and Onk stone are there. The name of the second river is Gihon, and the one that flowed around the whole land of Cush. The name of the third is the Tigris, which flows east of Assyria, and the fourth is the Euphrates. And so this is more like a, we think of a gar the Garden of Eden sometimes, and you might think of your garden in the backyard, or maybe a bigger one, but this is more like a national park. And there's rivers flowing over. It's huge. Think, think national park like, um, like in the south where there's you know it's it's more like more water than like on Mount Lassen or whatever. Um, but it's this beautiful place. 
And this is where he puts Adam and Eve. Eve hasn't been created yet as in the zoom in version of the story. And we're not going to read the, the creation of Eve specifically today. My point is this. God has put his image bearers into a, a particular place with an incredible job to do. Um, but look at verse 15. It says, and the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. This working and keeping is kind of a summary of all the the commands that we already saw, those four different uh, aspects of it. But it's interesting, the same words are used for priests in Numbers 3, 7, and 8, and then 18, 7. And it's to work or serve and guard or keep. So this is actually... A minister, there's another word for this, another way you can translate this word. So to serve and guard or keep, to serve and protect in a sense. I'm not trying to quote the police motto or whatever, Uh, but Adam and Eve have a huge job to do. And it's really to worship God by the way they work and serve him and then to protect what he's given them. So I think this is one of the, when, when people think rationally about like taking care of the earth, this is actually from God, like the, the, um, the people that are, um, you know, environmentalists and, and to, to be truly environmental, you have to, you have to look at it from God's perspective. The, we're meant to care for this earth. We're, we're meant to improve it and to treat it right. Yes. Use resources, but not use them all up. Right. We're, we're called in a Christian way to steward God's good earth. We're supposed to take care of it, but it's far more than just the ground or the plants or the environment. This is, uh, this is, again, creating culture and doing incredible things with what he has given us. So this is our calling. This is what we're about. This is what we're made for. But I want to talk about some implications that I think are the most important part. It's one thing to, to believe that you're made in God's image, which is important. Without that, you have no jumping off point. But how does this work its way into our lives? What does it have to do with our day-to-day and who we are? These, some of these are going to be pretty obvious, but the crucial implication based on the fact that every human being is creating the image of God. Think about f- just first off self-image or your self-awareness, whatever you want to call that. You reflect the glory of God as a rock-solid truth. Every person, every single man, woman, and child is creating the image of likeness of God. So this, this is where human dignity comes from. This is where value comes from, worth. Every human, every person has infinite and incredible worth because God made them in his image. This is where sometimes some people say, God doesn't make junk. I mean, he made everybody and he loves them because of that. They're his created person. So there are people that struggle with like being really down on themselves. There are people that think way too highly of themselves. This levels that ground. Say, no, no, no. We're all creating the image of God. You have no right, no right to think of yourself better than another person or to think of yourself more lowly than you should because God made you. And that, that's good news for us. Think about the implication, not just for what you think about yourself, but think about the way you treat other people. When I remember that every person I'm around is made in God's image, I treat them differently, don't I? Or I should, right? They, they deserve God's love and they deserve me to respect them and to honor them and to not belittle them or trash talk them. Or James 3, 9 says this, he's talking about our speech and literally our tongue here. He says, with it, we bless our Lord and Father and with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. So who am I to curse an image bearer? That's James is saying, that's ridiculous. Don't do that. There are no ordinary people, C.S. Lewis said. Every person you look at is not a mere mortal. They have been made for eternity. And that should remind us, or we need to be reminded about that all the time, the way we actually address people and treat people and talk about people. And the way we look at people, someone that is very different from you, or maybe someone that's from a you know, a way poorer class than you, or someone much richer, we still look at them. That's an image bearer. That's God's image bearer. So we ought to have this sacredness, this reverence and respect for humans, for other people. We, we, should, we should treat people with this kind of dignity and respect and value and worth that they deserve. Even if they're our enemy, even if they're somebody that we disagree with totally on just about anything you could think of, uh, even those that hate us, we still treat them with this kind of dignity. 
Another implication is, and this one's massive too, but think about human rights or civil rights, either one of those. Um, the idea of human rights came from the Bible. And this has been proven by scholars and people that aren't even Christians. They're like, you know, this is this is something Christianity gave and Judaism gave to the world as a gift. Um, things that this worked its way into our legal system in, in the West and in most countries in the West that humans have this inalienable right. That that idea from the founding fathers came directly from Judaism and Christianity. And this is just, it's it's just, that's, that's given in all arguments by most people, uh, by all scholars that study this. Think about the modern civil rights movement. Martin Luther King Jr. had a strong understanding of the image of God, and he wrote and talked about it all the time. A book, it's been over 10 years ago now, a book um, came out that was called um, Martin Luther King and the Image of God. And it just goes through and traces how in his his upbringing and then in his teaching and even in his, his preaching as he got to do that, he talked a lot about the fact that we are all created in God's image. This gives us this uniqueness, this worth, this dignity. And so this is something that um, the reason people believe in the, you know, the, the right to life and liberty is because of the Bible. It's because of Judaism and Christianity. What happens in a society that loses the idea of God and God's image. You can think of our culture right now. More people than ever are saying, I don't believe in God. I don't buy that. Or I'm, I'm atheist. Or I, just, I, I don't affiliate with any of those religions. So it's happening in our culture. So what happens there? Um, how, how can you ground human rights if you don't believe the image of God? Which I think most people in our country really don't. It becomes really hard to protect the elderly, the unborn, the disabled, um, the the you know widows it becomes harder and harder to protect those classes uh, of people if you don't have the image of God grounded in that if you kick God out and you saw this idea that people are life is important but I don't really know why you have to put it on basic you have to base it on something else and people that's where it gets really gray uh, for example um, a few years back Iceland proudly and boldly announced an eradication of Down syndrome in their country. And the reason for that is because every time someone was pregnant and diagnosed with a kid that was most likely going to have Downs, they would abort the baby. So they're saying, we don't have, we eradicated Down syndrome, but what they did is they actually eradicated the kids with Down syndrome. That's terrifying. In the early church, one of the things that became known for immediately um, in the Roman culture, slavery was legal, of course, infanticide. Um, you could you could leave your kid out and just let them be exposed and die if you didn't want, especially they did this with girls, if they didn't want girls. Um, the elderly and sick, it was legal just to do away with them, just let them die because they were too much of a burden on society. And Christians immediately said, no, we're not, we'll take those kids. We'll, we'll, we'll take these folks in. We'll, we'll care for the sick. They would run into plagues and hurt, and they became immediately known for looking after widows and orphans and poor and, and kids that were being neglected or, or left to die, all because they knew that every person was created in the image of God. And this eventually, uh, as I already mentioned, the entire Western world accepted this idea. And what happens when you take away the image of God, the circle of protection gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller for people. And you, you, you kind of, there's these now gray areas. Of, is that person really dignified if they're going to be disabled or have some kind of crippling disease or something that's going to make them have a difficult life? The circle gets smaller and smaller when we take that out. So those are just a few implications. There's probably a lot more to be said about that. But the main one I want you to hear is you are made in the image of God. And because of that, you have incredible value and dignity and worth in the eyes of God and should be in the eyes of all, especially Christians. What about we think about this, this great command or mandate or commission, as I called it, our, 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 our calling in life. Like God has made us for something. Just a couple main principles here. Number one, what you do is actually holy because you serve as God's steward and you're made in God's image. What you do, what, Colossians 3.23 says this, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. 
Um, 1 Corinthians 10, 31, you probably know this one too. Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. All of our lives are to be worship. And that doesn't mean going in the church building and singing songs all day. This means living your life for God, doing the things he's called you to. Think back to the mandate of filling the earth and subduing it and having dominion over it. This is what we're called to be about. When we do excellent work, this honors God. And I don't mean just you have to be the very best at whatever your trade or craft is, but when you just, you serve God and do, you know, use the talents and gifts he's given you to do what he's called you to do, then that is serving God. The mandate to be a steward of the earth, to make things, to accomplish good, to use raw materials to make things beautiful and good, to help people flourish, to, to help better their lives. This isn't just for Adam and Eve, this is for me and for you. You have God in the beginning with his hand in the soil making man. Then he makes us gardeners and and culture makers to cultivate, um, taking raw materials and making better things. What's music? It's taking the raw material and making it beautiful, notes or instruments. There's a divide often, we call it the sacred secular divide. And the reason I said what you do is holy, what you do is sacred, is because some people think, oh, that's, the sacred, the people that are really doing important work are the missionaries or the Bible translators or the pastors or the people that work, you know, serving the poor all the time. And, and those are all great things. But there is no such thing as sacred versus secular. See, God has called us into this world to serve and reign with him. And that's the sacred work. Whatever your job might happen to be, that's it. I want to read a, a couple really... Um, really famous verses about salvation. Just thinking about this big story. You probably know these, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For by grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It's the gift of God, not as a result of work, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So it says, by grace you've been saved through faith. The grace and the faith, they're not from you. They're not your work, so you can't boast. You can't say, man, I saved me. But the verse continues in verse 10, and it says, for we are his workmanship. This is a word, poema. It's, we get our word poem from it. This is a masterpiece. We are his masterpiece. Like this is talking about God's image in us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Those good works include building houses, uh, taking care of sick people. These good works are not just Christian works. This is, it's all the things God has called us into doing. So that verse answers the question, what are we saved from? That's our sin. But then it also answers the question, what are we saved for? Sometimes we stop with that and just rejoice over our forgiveness, which is a good thing to do. But we're saved into something, into this vocation, this calling that God has given to us. The first mandate, by the way, that God gave her creation is never revoked. It's not like sin comes along and he says, okay, never mind all that. Let's just talk about Jesus and the Bible and um, going to church and worshiping me and, and let's figure that out. But we're still called, this, this mandate is still intact for us today. We're still to be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, so do it. Rule over it as God's stewards. He is the king and we're his little kinglets, right? We're, her, we're, his, we're his, his prince and princesses running around fulfilling this great command he's given us. The one thing we haven't talked about that's kind of next in the story, but we have to touch on it briefly, is why is the image so messed up in so many people in, in my life too? What, what's the problem? Well, you know it's broken. You know it's because sin came into the world, which we'll talk about in the next couple of weeks. But think about it for a second. We're creating the image of God, and what happened to that image when sin came? This is the question. It, it didn't destroy it, but it, it defaced it. It, it, it kind of uh, clouded it. Um, after the fall, later on in Genesis 9, it says this, Whoever sheds the blood of man by man shall his blood be shed, for God made man in his own image. So you still have the image of God in you after sin comes in and starts messing with us. Um, it's still functioning. It's still a part of who we are, no matter who the person is, right? So being a sinner myself doesn't mean I'm no, I no longer have the image of God. It's still there. Uh, we already read James 3, 9, where it says we, we can curse people who are in the likes of God. So um, when we do that, um, we're still in God's image and we stay in God's image. And so does everybody. But the way salvation is described one, in one spot in Colossians 3, 10, it says we've put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. 
So we're in the image of God. Um, and, and now it's, it's kind of corrupted, it's defaced, whatever you want to call it. But when you put on Christ, he starts this process of shaping us and, again, remaking us into this good image of the Creator. We're, we're being conformed to the image of Christ, even, it says in the New Testament over and over again. So how does this, how does this work? Um, think about this. If you created 8 billion statues of you to put all over the planet, like God did, not obviously literal statues, but it's little images everywhere, it would mean that you want people to notice you. Like you want people to see something about you. So God made us so we'd reflect and communicate who he is, how great he is, what he's like, something about his love. Um, it's again like the mirror example. And what happened when sin came into the world is the mirror is supposed to be, you know, like say at 45 degrees and it's supposed to reflect God and just, you know, shine this way. Uh, but when sin comes into the world, it gets messed up. Um, we were convinced that our we're more important than God. Or we're, our, our, our image is the most important thing, not God's image anymore. And so it's like we flipped the mirror backwards. And now we're looking at it like this and, and God is hitting the backside of it, there's black paint or whatever, and it's not working anymore. So in salvation, the mirror gets turned back around, and it's still, you know, not perfectly clear, but the more we know God, the more the, the, the sin is worked out of our lives. Um, it gets wiped off gradually, and we begin to reflect God again. So being created in His image means that we reflect Him. We live in a way, we think in a way, we feel in a way that people are drawn to God. They're, they get attention toward Him. And Jesus said it this way, let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. That, that's the way to reflect the image of God as God is changing us. Jesus is the only perfect image that ever lived. And I think as we're drawn to Him and we let Him change us, we begin to clear away the kind of the, the fog of the mirror and, and reflect Him again like we're supposed to. There's an interesting verse in 2 Corinthians 3. Uh, Jesus, or excuse me, Paul's talking. He says, Yet to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their heart. So people are reading the Bible and they're, they're not quite seeing it because they don't yet know Jesus, it says. The next verse says, But when one turns to the Lord, the veil's removed. So it's, it's taken away. And we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. So what's going to draw our hearts back to that, that image of God, that glory? Well, it's going to be to come face to face with Jesus. I think that for us to just say, yeah, I, I believe God made humans in his image. And I believe he sent us out in this world to do great things for him, which includes doing good things for just society and people is a good start. But I, what I want to do is I just want to offer ourselves again to God. Be be renewed in uh, the excitement for whatever it is you get to do. Maybe you're retired and you, you, you volunteer and do things. Maybe you still have a job. See that job as an offering to God this week. Go to work and do well as you're working for him and it will bless the world around you. And be thankful for that. Um, don't feel like some kind of second class citizen because you're not a missionary or a pastor or something like that. We're, all these jobs and all the ways we dive into this world through work and through volunteering and just the way we love people are massive in God's hands if we give them to him. So let me pray that for you and for me. And I'll just say a couple more quick things. God, I'm so glad that um, you have created us. God, that you, uh, as we read in Psalm 8, what is man that you are mindful of him? God, that you care about us, that you created us so that we could, we could walk with you, that we could serve you and serve this world is an incredible gift. God, I pray that we would just take advantage of that this week. And as we go to work or get to do whatever we do, um, remember that, um, remind us rather that we are your ambassadors. You're sending us out to do great things for your kingdom and bless people along the way. And we'll give you the praise for all you do. In Jesus' name, amen. I know if you watch these often, it probably sounds like a broken record, but I really do mean this. If there's a way we could pray for you, or if you need help with something, you want to, you want to give us a call or stop by, come on in, and we'd love to serve you and uh, or encourage you or pray for you if we can. And uh, otherwise, have a great week, and hopefully we'll see you soon in person. Thanks again for being with us today. Mm -hmm.